picture might be worth a thousand words, but on January 28, 1969, the words in the Pittsburgh press said it all. The previous morning, a 37-year-old named Chuck Knoll had been hired to reverse the fortunes of the worst team in the NFL. Later in the day, the Pittsburgh Steelers selected a little-known defensive tackle with the fourth pick in the NFL draft. Steelers' first-round selection, Joe Green. And there it was, dutifully reported in so many words, the birth of a pro football dynasty. Andy Russell, number 34, was the Steelers' defensive captain a studious linebacker who'd been around since 1963. Back in the 60s, the Steelers were pretty bad. We just could not consistently win games. We would lose games by the most bizarre circumstances. We'd, we'd find a way to lose every time. So it was a very frustrating experience and quite a remarkable change when Chuck Knoll came. He called me in in the offseason. I'd made my first Pro Bowl in 1968 prior to him coming. And I thought, well, he's calling me in to congratulate me. So I went in to see him, shook hands, but he wasn't overly friendly. And he, he looks at me and he says, you know, Russell, I've been watching the game film since I've taken over the job here. And he said, I don't like how you play. You're too aggressive. You're too out of control. You're trying to be the hero. You're trying to make big plays. I'm going to change the way you play. I'll make you a better player than you are now because you're not disciplined enough. I was just stunned. Then we get to training camp, and the first speech to the team, he said, look, I've been watching the game films since I took the job, and I can tell you guys, the reason you've been losing is not because of your attitude or your psyche or any of that stuff. The problem is, is you're not good enough. You know, you can't run fast enough, you can't jump high enough, you're not quick enough. Your techniques are just abysmal. I'm going to probably have to get rid of most of you, and uh, we're going to move on. And... I I mean, five of us made it from that room to the 74 Super Bowl. One of those five was the first player the Steelers drafted the day Noel was hired. I had been holding out for probably two, three weeks. The day I signed my contract, they escorted me down to the practice field where I was met by all the offensive linemen. And immediately, we did a one-on-one -on -one blocking drill with Ray Mansfield, picked him to go first because Ray Mansfield wanted to show him what a veteran will show a rookie. And Joe destroyed Ray Mansfield, our center, for so many years. And we were like, whoa, this guy, this guy can play. Those offensive linemen didn't like me a whole lot. The opposition liked him even less. Joe Green would come in the huddle sometimes and say, I'm taking the ball away this play and do it. I mean, I've never in my whole career ever seen an athlete be able to do that. He's actually unblockable in those early years. He was unblockable, but Joe Green was also uncontrollable. The Steelers won just 12 games in his first three seasons. And on days like this one in Philadelphia, losing brought out the worst in him. <laughs> oh, I acted very poorly. They came over to me and said, uh, Captain Russell, would you talk to Mr. Green? I said, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, the clock is ticking away, and they're just about to win the ball game. And I, in my frustration, I just was so disappointed. I picked the ball up and threw it into the stands and walked off the field. Well, it's the middle of the fourth quarter. So the game's over. I'm sorry. That was, that was not a good day for Joe Green and the Steelers. I just think that uh, Joe Green showed, even us old veteran players, that uh, there's a different way to think. You know, you can't accept losing. The fiery temper of mean Joe Green would prove to be the perfect complement for the icy cool of Chuck Knoll. Obviously, I'm guessing, but I don't know if anyone would have tolerated my behavior the way Chuck did. What Chuck saw was a very energetic, raw kid that wanted to play and wanted to win, and he knew that it was immaturity, and he didn't quash that enthusiasm. He let me get it out, and then he let me mold it in a positive way, as he did many of us. Basically, he was saying, it's not what we're gonna do, it's how we're gonna do it.
I'm not going to ever give you a motivational speech because if I have to motivate you, I will fire you. I was playing a game in St. Louis early, early in 69, made my first big mistake. My man caught a touchdown pass. He came down, he stood next to me, he said, uh, Andy, when we gave up that touchdown, uh, what was your thought process? I looked at him, he, said, he wants to know my thought process. As you walked away, I said, there's a guy I want to play for. At the time, I didn't want to be a Pittsburgh Steeler uh, because of the, of, of the history. But, uh, I mean, how could I change it? Couldn't ask for, for a better head coach, a, a, a person that knew what he wanted, knew how to get it. We never saw him crack. He was solid, a rock. Art Rooney owned the Pittsburgh Steelers for nearly 40 years and never won a thing. But no one who worked for him ever called the Chief a loser. The Chief was a, a great gentleman. He was at every practice. You know, I don't care if it was snowing and cold and winds blowing, he's out there and, you know, he's got his cigar and he's watching practice. And, he, and he's all bundled up and then he would talk to us after every practice. He always had something good to say to you, something kind to say to you. He was your boss and you knew that. But he gave the persona that he was a real person and that he cared about those guys in the locker room. In 1970, the old man gave his team a new home. But Three Rivers Stadium wasn't the Steelers' only construction project. After four decades, Art Rooney and his sons were finally assembling a young and talented team. He's a blonde bomber. Yeah. Quarterback Terry Bradshaw and cornerback Mel Blunt arrived in 1970. Linebacker Jack Ham in 71. All three were future Hall of Famers. By 72, Joe Green was flanked on the defensive line by L.C. Greenwood, number 68, Dwight White, 78, and Ernie Holmes, 63. 1972 was also the year the Steelers drafted a fullback from nearby Penn State. It didn't take Franco Harris very long to impress his new teammates. We played a game, I think it was in Atlanta, it was a preseason game. And Franco runs up to the line, looks like he stops and maybe scratches his head, what am I going to do now? And all of a sudden he goes, takes off. Gee, we got one. We got one. Harris rushed for over 1,000 yards in his rookie year, leading the Steelers to the playoffs for the first time in their four seasons under Chuck Knoll. 1972 was, was, was magic. It was like the whole town was waiting for this forever. These fans suffered for so long. And in 1972, it was like a big awakening. Every player had his own fan club. And at the center of it all was the rookie from Penn State. We need to have an army. And so they thought about it and said, oh, this kid's half Italian, you know? So, uh, let's have the Franco's Italian army and sound like a good idea Franco, let's go, Franco, let's go. and it just caught on fire and everybody wanted to be Italian <laughs> what's, 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 what's red, green and white man? what's that? red, green and white I mean yeah Franco in that season oh, it, was, it was a beautiful happening it, it was a wonderful thing for for Franco for the city of Pittsburgh, for the football team, and for everyone. 50,000 people standing and applauding. This is the ovation for Frank O'Hara. It's down to one big play. Fourth down and 10 yards to go. One 
52 seconds remaining. Bradshaw running out of the pocket, looking for somebody to throw to. Fires it downfield. And there's a collision. And that, that's caught out of the air. The ball is pulled in by Franco Harris. Harris is going for a touchdown for Pittsburgh. The immaculate reception delivered the first postseason victory in Steelers history. After 40 years, they were finally winners. Out of nowhere came Franco Harris, riding a white stallion down the field, heading up Franco's Italian army, charging under the football, and galloping off into the sunset. We had some people together when Franco came, and we didn't win anything. We didn't win any Super Bowls before Franco, and didn't win any after him. After five seasons and two playoff appearances, Chuck Knoll's Steelers were ready for a Super Bowl run. And 1974 began with perhaps the greatest infusion of talent in NFL history. Pittsburgh on a first round selects Lynn Swan, wide receiver, Southern California. Lynn Swan and fellow wide receiver John Stallworth. Center Mike Webster linebacker Jack Lambert. The Steelers added four Hall of Famers in a single draft. An injury forced Lambert into the starting lineup immediately to the shock of his veteran teammates. To look at Lambert, he doesn't look like a middle linebacker. At 6'5", 218 pounds, he doesn't pass the eye test. But he could play. <laughs> Lambert may have made the biggest impact, but the most talked about player in camp wasn't a rookie. Well, the Pittsburgh Steelers have just completed the exhibition season as the only undefeated team in professional football. There is also a sociological aspect, a kind of sociological undertow to what the Steelers have been doing. The Pittsburgh Steelers are historically one of pro football's have-not clubs. And it may be appetite which has made them innovative to the extent of contemplating in this season of promise the NFL's first successful black quarterback. That quarterback was Joe Gilliam, a third-year pro who had started one game in place of an injured Terry Bradshaw in 73. I came in with Joe Gilliam, and I was just amazed to see this skinny kid throw this football. I could not believe his talent. Gilliam's stellar performance in the 74 preseason created a quarterback controversy in Pittsburgh. It was in the air. It was on the airways. It was on, it was on the radio. They were staring it up. But the calmness was what was happening in the locker room. That was no controversy. It would be bad. It was bugger in the locker room. It wouldn't be bad. Thinking about it now, imagine the pressure that was on the head coach. Probably wasn't any. You know, Chuck would always tell us that you only felt pressure when you didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> would you say realistically that he has a good fighting chance to be your number one quarterback at the beginning of the season? Well, he's uh, he's done very well in preseason. He's been the uh, uh, the most productive, and uh, that's what we look at. Whoever's in there. That's my quarterback, and that's what I'm rooting for. It was a surprise decision, but when they made that decision, I was happy for Joe. Tell you what, he loved to throw that ball. Here's Gilliam from the pocket, firing downfield. There goes Swan, it into the high, touchdown, Pittsburgh. Gilliam not only won the starting job, he passed for over 600 yards as the Steelers scored 65 points in the first two games of the regular season. Joe lit it up, and this is the new Steeler offense. It appeared the Steelers were seeing their future, and so was the rest of America. Yes, that was true. He was black, and he was the quarterback. The Oakland Raiders didn't care who was the quarterback. They had beaten the Steelers in the 73 playoffs and bludgeoned them in a week three rematch. They shut us out. 
and you get shot out on your on, on your own home home turf, and you thinking that you are a Super Bowl contending team, that can really shatter you know your hopes and shatter your confidence. Gilliam threw a pair of interceptions and completed just 10 of his 31 passes. The Oakland Raiders have laid the first defeat on Pittsburgh. Making matters worse, Franco Harris was injured and missed the next two games. Without him, the offense fell apart. Gilliam's play deteriorated. He completed fewer than 40% of his passes over the next three games. But the Steelers won all three behind a defense that was maturing into one for the ages. The front four of Green, Greenwood, White, and Holmes had become dominant. All four were individual standouts. Together, they were the Steel Curtain. The great thing about the front four is, is that they could put all the heat on the quarterback by themselves. They didn't need blitzes. Jack Ham and I and Lambert rarely blitzed. We didn't, we didn't have to. So we were able, therefore, to play pass defense. In the three games after the loss to Oakland, the defense forced 15 turnovers. Pass intercepted. Picked off by Jack Lambert at the 15-yard line. We just believed that we could beat a team sometimes by ourselves. I mean, we were going to take the ball away from them and score ourselves. I mean, they were incredible. And they knew we were struggling. And then they stepped it up. You know why? Because they had to. After six games, the Steelers were 4-1-1. One one. You know, that's not a bad record. We, we certainly weren't embarrassed about that, but there was some sense that we're not, we're not cohesive. We're not coming together. We weren't a contender at this time. We were winning. But for the offense, do we need a change here? From the moment the Steelers made him the first pick of the 1970 draft, Terry Bradshaw was an enigma. We all knew he was an extraordinarily gifted uh, player, an awesome talent. If you stood next to him and watched him throw the football, it was almost mind-boggling how, how good he was. I mean, physically talented. Obviously, it was taking him, and it took all of us, a lot of time to learn how to play the game. He had been struggling with that. Big question mark. Big question mark. Uh... Terry showed signs of being the great player that he is a lot. But, you know, Terry would make mistakes, too. And when things go bad on offense, who gets the blame? Quarterback. And, you know, Terry uh, got blamed for a lot of things. In four years, Bradshaw had gone from golden boy to whipping boy. He chafed under the harsh tutelage of his head coach. And by the time he lost his starting job in 74, he was emotionally shell-shocked. I think he went into somewhat of seclusion when he wasn't at practice. He was going home to no one and staying home, staying in his apartment. Uh, don't go out to the restaurants that I used to frequent. Uh, don't read the newspapers because they're going to say bad things about you. Uh, so you, you're crushed a little bit there. I've apologized to him, frankly. I criticized him a few times in the locker room for, you know, a certain kind of behavior or whatever, and, and, and I, was wrong. I was wrong. I mean, I, I should not have done that. Uh, I should have been more sensitive to a young man's, uh, you know, emotions, and I was like, you know, toughen up and you know, just get out there and get it done. You know, the old school kind of thinking, and I think I was wrong. Bradshaw watched the first six games of the 74 season from the sidelines. His team missed him. What is the right combination? What's the thing that gels your team, makes your team productive? Uh, I felt very comfortable with Terry. I always liked Terry. And then I felt Terry was a winner. I wasn't on the stump about it, but when the question came up, I thought Terry was the guy. On a Monday night against Atlanta, Bradshaw returned. 
the backfield that would start in four of the next six Super Bowls was finally in place. For us at that particular time, the running game was our bread and butter with a few passes sprinkled in here and there, you know. Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer, number 20, combined for over 200 yards rushing as the Steelers defeated the Falcons 24-17. It uh, felt good, and I think it just started to lay the groundwork for where we wanted to go. Of course, the defense was already there. In week eight, the Steelers shut out Philadelphia 27-0, holding the Eagles to less than 150 total yards. But Bradshaw was still a colt who had not yet been broken, and Chuck Knoll had little patience for his wild ways. After a loss in Cincinnati, Bradshaw was benched again, this time in favor of veteran backup Terry Hanratty, number five. All of us knew that Terry Hanratty wasn't our future. I mean, he wasn't the future of the Pittsburgh Steelers. In Cleveland, Hanratty completed two passes and threw three interceptions. The quarterback situation was a mess, but the rest of the team was playing at a championship level. Harris ran for 156 yards, and the defense caused seven turnovers as the Steelers rallied to defeat the Browns and remain in first place in the AFC Central Division. In week 11, Bradshaw was back. But in a 28-7 defeat of the New Orleans Saints, he ran for more yards than he passed for. During that game against New Orleans, we went to uh, three running backs. <laughs> In less than two months, Super Bowl IX would be played on the very same field. And that was no laughing matter. I know, I wasn't thinking that we were going to be there. That was the furthest thing from my mind, thinking about being there in the next two months. We had a long way to go. No player on the Steelers loomed larger than Joe Green, and his influence was growing. Late in the 74 season, he developed a new technique called the Stunt 4-3, and convinced his coaches to let him use it. He jumped in the gap between the guard center, tilted his body, and just blew through that gap, and, and it, was, it was devastating. People didn't know what to do. The stunt 4-3 wreaked utter havoc. Teams were forced to commit so many blockers to Green that his teammates often went completely unblocked. Even when they doubled or triple teamed him, offenses felt the wrath of Mean Joe. Unfortunately, so did his own offense after a 13-10 loss in week 12 to the lowly Houston Oilers. We should have beaten the Oilers and we were going to be a championship team. And we didn't. We just stuck up the place on offense. There it is, there it is! There it is, Terry! Come on, Terry! I said, oh, hell. I'm just tired of this. I think after that ball game, something changed. Next night, the Miami Dolphins played the Cincinnati Bengals on Monday night, and they methodically destroyed the Cincinnati. And I became so jealous and enraged about that. Why can't we be like that? Why can't we execute like that? Joe uh, had a mind snap. And he said, I'm, I'm through. I can't, I, 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 my only goal is to be on a Super Bowl team. I want to win playoff games. I, want, I, I, don't, I, I, can't, I can't stand this. I'm going to leave. I went to my locker and picked up my belongings. And I walked to the parking lot and got in my car. And my actions were that my 
thoughts were that <laughs> I don't know what they were, but I was leaving because I'm um, disappointed. And uh, but in the midst of all that, I said, "Boy, I sure hope somebody come out here and stop me." Cooler heads prevailed, and Green rejoined the team for the most important game of the season in New England. Going into New England, if we won that game, we would win a division, and I have to tell you, that was a big emotional high for me, knowing that uh, all the struggles that we went through this past year, all the turmoil, uncertainties, that we're still in this position. With a victory against the Patriots, the Steelers would clinch a berth in the playoffs for the third straight year. You know, I personally was nervous. I remembered the 60s. You know, I was always going back thinking, well, you know, we lost all those games. and Is this going to happen again? And, and are we going to find some stupid way to lose this game? We had our work cut out for us. But the Steelers made quick work of the Patriots. And here is Bradshaw throwing for Lynn Swan. And Lynn Swan going for Swan. Holding it for touchdown. It felt so wonderful. It was like a big load off our shoulders. I think what we were happy about was not necessarily winning the division, but beating a good team on the road and looking good doing it. They've got him, and it's going to be a two-pointer. That's it. Uh -huh. Two points. There's the safety. L.C. Greenwood sacked him. There was just a new spirit. Now we're starting again a brand new season. Plus, we have our people in place now. Win or lose, this is, this is who we have. The title of Sports Illustrated's playoff preview read, For Openers, Super Bowl Eight and a Half, a reference to the first round playoff game between the Raiders and Dolphins. The Steelers were described as the only team in the playoffs without a quarterback and were expected to lose at home to the Buffalo Bills. Here come the Pittsburgh Steelers, you know, team without a quarterback, team without this, team without that. The last time the Steelers had faced the Bills, O.J. Simpson had rushed for 189 yards. The Juice had put some yards on us. We were concerned about him for sure. We always did have the ability to rush the pass or put pressure on the pass and make him uncomfortable, create turnovers in the middle of the season. But down in the playoffs when you meet the best teams, we didn't have success stopping the run, and we knew we had to. Let's go, Juice! Juice get in, Juice! The Steelers held Simpson to only 49 yards, but the defense did not stop him alone. What happened was our offense won that game. Our offense just took over, and Buffalo could not give the ball to O.J. They didn't have time. By halftime, Terry Bradshaw was in the midst of the finest performance in his five-year career. He's now reaching that level where he's relaxed, he can execute, and it, and it was just a beautiful thing to see. Just when you get around, just slow down so I can hit you like a hook. Okay. And we got all kind of running room. Yeah. Now what we are seeing is three weeks of solid performance by everyone after that Houston debacle. And this is where, you know, the, the attitudes start to build. This year, of course, our, our main goal is to, is to get to and win the Super Bowl. And we knew that in order to do that, we were going to have to, uh, or we'll have to beat Miami. And whether it's the first game or the second game, it, it really doesn't make any difference. They're the world champions. Uh, you know, they're a great football team. In a game that lived up to its hype, the Raiders defeated the two-time defending Super Bowl champion Dolphins on a last-minute touchdown that went into NFL lore as the Sea of Hands. 
Oakland had won the so-called Super Bowl eight and a half. But in the aftermath, they might have lost Super Bowl nine when Raiders coach John Madden went a little too far in his praise of both teams. John Madden had been quoted as saying when the two best teams in football, Miami Dolphins and Oakland Raiders, get together, great things will happen. Hey, I have to admit, that was a great game. <laughs> it was a great game. <laughs> All right? Two great teams. But when they already accepted the crown, that didn't sit well with us. And, and, and even though they beat us earlier in the season, you know, that was like, so what? Okay, we weren't at our best at that time, and we're kind of like a new team here now, right? With, with, with some new spirit. Of all people, it was the Steelers' stoic head coach who galvanized that new spirit. Chuck made a comment, didn't raise his voice, but the, his voice did change when he said that uh, the best team in the National Football League didn't play yesterday. And the Super Bowl wasn't played yesterday. The Super Bowl is going to be played in two weeks, and the best football team in the league is sitting here in this room. Wow. I mean, everybody just went crazy. Joe Green was sitting right next to me, and he just sort of rose up out of this, this little uh, desk chair, you know, and kind of stood up in the desk chair and had draped to his legs. And he was ready to play right, right then. He was so psyched. I mean, I've never seen Chuck Noll do an emotional thing like this. It was out of character for him to say things like that. But it was right on the money, it was what we needed. It didn't matter who we played, where we played them, they were gonna lose. And Bradshaw on the draw, gives it to Harris, straight to the middle and into the end zone for a Pittsburgh touchdown. Stabler's back to throw, and it is intercepted. There's an interception by Jack Ham. Madden was very much like Chuck, Chuck Noll. He wanted to dominate the, the sticks. He wanted to move the ball on the ground. And we knew we were going to have to stop that run. And they had a great offensive line. Half of them are Hall of Famers. You got Gene Upshaw and Hart Shell. Uh, and Ernie steps over the ball and he said, Eugene! Upshaw! Upshaw finally turns around because he was in the huddle. <laughs> and Ernie said, I'm going to kick you. Ernie Holmes had plenty of help. The Steelers rushed for over 200 yards. The Raiders rushed for 29. Their running game didn't have a chance. They were just bewildered. You've heard people brag about a lot of things. and They talk about being in the zone. They don't know what the hell the zone is about. Because you don't get there. You don't live in the zone. You, you, you visit the zone probably once in your life. And I don't want to trivialize it because it didn't happen. And I played 13 years. I was in the zone one time. And I think our team was in the zone. in the fourth quarter, Franco Harris's second touchdown sealed Pittsburgh's first trip to the Super Bowl. Then scoring again and knowing that we got it, it was unbelievable. That was the uh, most euphoric uh, moment the, I, I, I think I'd, I'd ever felt on a football field. That precise moment when you know that the next ball game will be in the Super Bowl, it's, it's, it is, oh man, it just, it just doesn't get any better. It doesn't get any better than that. I tell people that that was the biggest game of the whole 70s team. It made us realize that we're a really good football team. And right now, we're probably the best. And, and that really set the tone for what was to come for the rest of the decade.
Chuck Knoll was an assistant coach for the Baltimore Colts when they lost to the New York Jets in Super Bowl III. Knoll believed the Colts were too tight before that game. So he took no chances when his Steelers went to New Orleans. Early in the week, he said, go out and no bed check. Get this town out of your system. So we took him up on that little challenge. We had a good time in New Orleans. Dwight didn't. Me, Dwight, Elsie, and Ernie, we threw the bags in the room and went right down to Bourbon Street and ordered all the strength that they ever had. <laughs> then at the end of that, uh, Dwight was ill. And uh, we, he ended up going to the hospital and, you know, we thought he'd been sabotaged. <laughs> By Wednesday, we were begging for a bed check. We were, we were tired. The way Chuck approached it, I think, made all the difference in the world. The time he gave us, responsibility that he gave us, was, to me, a wonderful way to approach it. Knoll's approach was in direct contrast to that of Vikings coach Bud Grant, whose team had lost two previous Super Bowls. The Vikings were stuck out at the airport. They had a bed check early. They didn't have the fun. They didn't have the relaxed atmosphere for the first three or four nights. So I think that was important because we went into that game, I think, far more relaxed than the, the Vikings. The difference between the two teams was evident when Steelers safety Glenn Edwards ran into a former college teammate and current Viking in the tunnel before the game. Land in his southern draw. Hey, Boop. How you doing? Good luck. And the guy was a stone face, looking straight ahead, wouldn't, wouldn't even look at me. He said, hey. I said, I said, hello, I'm speaking to you. And the guy wouldn't say anything to him. And he gets in between him. He pushes in between him, and he says, okay, bub, buckle up then. And the game was on. Right behind Joe Green was number 78, Dwight White, who spent the week in the hospital and lost 20 pounds. You know, I guess we're trying to humor him because we know he's not going to play. When we go through our warm-ups, when we take a, you know, a headbutt, we clash together. And I thought he was going to, you know, fall and pass out, but he, he hung in there, you know. White more than hung in there. He started and played most of the game. He even scored the only two points of the first half on a safety. How he managed to play that day and how he managed to play as well as he played, it's, I don't know if he knows. Our attitude as a defense was, we're going to win this game 2-0. I mean, that's, that's it. The Steelers shut down the Minnesota ground game just as they had to Buffalo and Oakland. The Vikings ran the ball 20 times for a total of 17 yards. Quarterback Fran Targenton fared no better. He completed just 11 of his 27 passes and threw three interceptions. I intercepted one. Didn't run very far. Franco Harris ran further than anyone ever had in the Super Bowl. He set a record with 158 rushing yards and was named the game's most valuable player. My wildest dreams during the season, I was like, scoring a touchdown on Super Bowl, for the thing from my mind. And here it is. Bradshaw giving it to Harris, getting a key block for Mullins, running to the left, running to the right, and now puts it to third. Harris running wide to the left, walking into the end zone for the touchdown, and the Steelers are on the board with their first TD of the afternoon. Harris's coronation was Terry Bradshaw's validation. With the Steelers clinging to a three-point fourth-quarter lead, the game was in the quarterback's hand. Got two yards to go on third down. He's going to pass. Terry Bradshaw fires, and it's caught at the 40. Holy smoke! Bradshaw engineered a seven-minute drive that finished off the Vikings and laid to rest any remaining doubts in the blonde bomber. There's a touchdown here. I can't see it all. Brad throws a strike. I'll never forget that. He hit Larry Brown in the chest, and you could hear it ricochet off his breastplate. 
sounded throughout that stadium as though it was a gun going off. Sounded like a cannon had gone off. Maybe it was my heart, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think anybody was, anyone was, was, was as happy as Terry was. Terry had more ups and downs after that, but that probably gave him the, the confidence, the staying confidence that regardless of how things come out, that you're still good enough to play. But it wasn't Bradshaw or any player who got the game ball for a victory four decades in the making. Would have been a natural to give it to Franco as MVP or give it to, uh, you know, Joe Green or LC. But I, you know, I thought, we, you know, we got to give it to, to the Chief. You could almost see tears in his eyes. I think I had tears in my eyes. And I had such respect for that gentleman. To see him after all those years to rise to the top of the mountain was quite an experience. Mr. Roselle presenting that award, that trophy to, to Mr. Rooney, you could see that his glasses got fogged up. It was a special moment for him, for sure, because this was it. This was a long journey, a long journey. The same could be said for all of them. There it is. That's the 1974 Super Bowl nine. I was part of two Super Bowl victories, and, and some people have asked me, why don't you wear the second ring? I said, well, the second ring, it, the first one's so much harder to win than the second one. I mean, once you've done it, then you think you can, you, you know you can do it, because you've done it. And, it's, uh, and so I think the first one was uh, the, the absolutely quintessential moment of all Steeler time, and it will remain so. The something that champions have that you can only get by being in it getting kicked around until you say you don't want to get kicked around anymore. I think that's what happened over the course of that 74 season. Chuck probably knew better than anybody that at that point in time, he had a team that would compete for years for that Super Bowl trophy because we got a taste of it. We got a taste of it.